Well, welcome. Here we are again. Um, it's the last Wednesday in July. It's, I'm uh, sorry, in June. Let me not get ahead. <laughs> Woo! Um, it's the last Wednesday in June. We're here, Makers at the Hall. Um, as I have discovered, I like to say, we're in one of the best rooms in Portland, um, the library here. Um, we have here tonight, um, oh, my name. I'm <laughs> Megan Reedy. Um, I'm a member of this group of the, the Maine Charitable Mechanics Association. I've been working with the program committee, which has been wonderful. Um, this ongoing series, it is every last Wednesday of the month. Um, we have two new ones coming up. July's is going to be um, a maker's mix. We're hoping that makers of all stripes and persuasions will come along, converse with each other, see who each other is. Um, so that's going to be a neat event. Um, in August, we're going to have a panel discussion. The last Wednesday in July is almost, or in August, is almost into September, so it's going to be right around Labor Day. Um, so we'll have a conversation about unions and guilds and associations, that kind of thing, which I think will be interesting. Um, the series as a whole is supported generously by the Warren Memorial Foundation, so we're very grateful for that. And this evening, the reason y'all are here is to, um, is to hear Doug Green talk. Doug Green of, Doug, uh, of Green Furniture Designs. And Green Design I'm Furniture. Green Design Furniture. <laughs> Goodness okay. gracious. It all fits. Um, thankfully, he is going to do the talking about his own story and life. <laughs> and um, he and I will catch up at the end. We'll chit chat. I know I've got a couple questions for Doug already percolating in my mind. And we'll be sure and leave time for there to be questions from from you. I'm sure questions, are, if they're not there already, they will come up during the talk. And then don't forget, at the end, there is cake. Um, so who can resist? Um, we'll be here uh, a little bit after that still to, to chat with each other. So Doug. OK. Good evening. Thank you for coming out. I'm Doug Green. And uh, I see some familiar faces here today, which is great. And, uh, but I, just, I wasn't really sure about what the interest of the group was going to be. So I'm, I'm going to try to do a uh, ready, fire, aim kind of talk tonight where I'll, I'll you know, I'm going to go very quickly through um, the history of how I got to this moment. And, uh, and then, but if you find that I'm, you know, if, if you want to stop me and, uh, you know, ask me to go a little bit deeper into a certain area, we can, I can do that. I'm happy to be interrupted. Um, or we can come around at the end and, and talk more about topics that you want um, that, that, that I will be sailing by pretty quickly. Okay? And uh, so thank you for coming out. I hope it's a little warm. But, um, we'll, uh, you know, just take your clothes off if you... <laughs> it's okay. You're right. Uh -huh. Okay. So also, I love this organization. I, I was involved... Uh, a couple of year and a half ago, I guess, started a process where they were um, looking at how to project this uh, organization to its into its second hundred years. Because last year was it last year was the second was two hundred year anniversary of of being in Portland. So it's a it's really has a remarkable history, and I think going forward, it's a very interesting time because you know it's like there's there's been this great resurgence of people making things. And the commonality of that um, would find a beautiful spot to get together in this place. And so I think that's where we're headed here. So without further ado, um, I ended up in Maine. Um, I went to college here in Brunswick, a small liberal arts school. And I was a liberal artist back in, and I graduated in 1977. My college sweetheart is sitting in the back there. <laughs> OK. And uh, so which is very nice. And my first job out of college was, because I was so qualified to do nothing, uh, was as a preschool teacher. And uh, while teaching three to five year olds uh, for over a period of about two years, I started making things for fun. And I, my first tools were a Dremel table saw that was on the coffee table in the living room. And uh, so every night I'd be, there'd be this terrible dremel and grinding sounds coming out of the living room. And so as things go, um, I got bigger tools. I actually went to friends' shops to, uh, to borrow tools and to make things bigger and bigger. So that, that's one of the first, you know, so the, the scale of things got bigger and bigger. That's a blanket chest, which I think you still have. That's right. Um, and this was my first commission. 
uh, a harvest table, um, which I think it took me a couple maybe two or three weeks to make with, with zero tools, um, but I made like 20 times the amount I would have made being a preschool teacher at the same time. So um, I quickly ditched preschool teaching and rented a little space. And I tried to find an apprenticeship and um, to learn more, and it was really hard. It was like I had no experience, so I did the most logical thing was start my own business. And uh, so I opened up a little shop. I rented some space in the back of somebody else's shop. And I put myself through an apprenticeship. And I just built a series of pieces and escalating difficulties and went and visited people and read books. And it was kind of a uh, self-imposed, uh, very quick education. And after a couple of years, I was making pieces like that, um, that table there. And that first shop was in Topsom, Maine. And after about two or three years doing that, I got a visit from Tom Mosier, who was looking for a cabinet maker. Um, for his shop, which back then was about 12 years old, I think, or ma I was 10 or 12 years old. And so I became one of five cabinet makers there where we were still making stuff by hand. It was a very um, 18th century shop in a way. And uh, we were doing shaker furniture. And one of the things that after about six months, the uh, manager of the shop came to me and said, he, he couldn't understand it because I was the greenest guy there, and, uh, but I had become the most efficient guy. I was, I was producing more furniture than anybody else. And it turns out I have this natural inclination to try to figure out how to not waste time. And so, I, and so I'm, a, I'm kind of a process guy. If like, I have a stack of dishes, I'm going to try to figure out the fastest way, you know, what the most methodical way of getting everything into the drainer so I can go you know, watch television or something. And so, um, so I'd started inventing new processes there. And they're very primitive, but um, after six months, um, I, was, I, was, um, I wasn't making better furniture than the master craftsman, but I was just not wasting time. I kind of had everything kind of lined up always. And somebody told me that what I was doing was called industrial design. And I'd never heard of industrial design before. And so I um, started doing some research, and it turns out industrial design um, was what I was born to do. And uh, so it's basically what's, what's different between craft production and industrial design is craft production is when the, the producer is, or the artist is making the, the product. And he's kind of making it as he goes. And that's kind of how the plan happens, one at a time usually. And in industrial design, it's about designing stuff that's made in quantities by somebody else. And so the, the focus is on um, a lot of things that, are, um, that you have to spend time with when you're making tens of thousands of, of pieces of things. So it's, a, it's very different than making one piece. Because when you're making one piece, you're not concerned with how, how long it takes to make it, for example. And so when I'm making 10,000 pieces, then you're worried about um, you know, efficiency, profitability. You're worried about um, you know, whether the ergonomics are good, the concept is good. So, um, so I ended up after, uh, six months after that, I, after a year, I left Mosher. And oh, I was going to show you some. Uh, this is Fr Raymond Lowy, uh, who was kind of the granddaddy of American industrial design. So he, was, he kind of came to America in, in the 1930s. Um, he was born in France, but he basically was the guy who did a lot of recognizable design and took design from basically um, the primitive method of design is that the engineers would kind of, the guys, you know, would, design would kind of come out of a haphazard kind of process of the guys who made things. And this was the guy who actually started with a concept for a new idea for a locomotive, a new look for a locomotive. And uh, so, you know, and so the first one is total fantasy, and the second one starts to get more definition, and then it ends up being pretty close to what finally gets produced. And so it's kind of a little, just a sketch of what the industrial design process looks like. He was responsible for consumer products. He did branding, too. Um, a lot of famous brands were his, uh, Lucky Strike, Pan Am, um, things like that are still around today. And so I ended up leaving Maine I enrolled at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, New York, and went to the graduate program there, and where I started to, to think like a designer. And so it was a really great program. 
uh, for me because it was um, the, 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 the best thing I learned there was how to be patient with the process. Because as a craftsman, I learned how um, to get into the shop and make something very efficiently. Um, when you're designing, you have to live in your notebook <laughs> for a very long time, thinking about what it is and drawing it and making models. And this, the desire to kind of close in on an idea and get to, get to work, get to making it, um, is antithetical to actually inventing something, to actually um, innovating. Because, uh, you know, it's the fr every, like 99% of the people have the first same idea. And the designer is the person that goes through 100 hundreds of iterations of it and develops it and ask, continues asking deeper problems and stuff. So um, I had, uh, that was the biggest thing that happened to me in graduate school was learning how to, to live in that, in that area of uncertainty for a long time. So this is, this, you know, basically projects went from imagining a new kind of gas station delivery system to, this was a three position children's chair um, that never got manufactured but someday. <laughs> Um, after I finished school, I went, I did work for a variety of design firms. Um, I was doing point of purchase design for, you know, magic markers, which is basically presentation cases in stores and, and you know, the look of, of Pentels. And then I went to work for a company that did architectural lighting. And also they, they did the, and I became an architectural lighting designer, um, doing the design for large public buildings, museums, train stations, churches. Um, back then in the uh, mid 80s, it was like mega cathedrals, you know, the, the big, um, what do you call them? The, those huge um, evangelical mega, mega, mega churches, yeah. Um, which had studio lighting, Olympic sized baptismal pools and things like that. And so, um, and then I quit and to go freelance. And then I was hired to design a line of light fixtures, which were, these were the most technical things I've ever done, um, which were all extruded aluminum to, um, they were designed to throw light in, in very specific patterns into big spaces. And so those are still being produced today, which is a nice thing. And on the side, I got involved in theater, in off-Broadway theater, and had a lot of fun doing that. That was kind of my second job. Um, and so in the uh, early 90s, 1990, I started playing around with an idea to build a sofa for my apartment um, because I hated all sofas I saw commercially. I just thought they were really stupid that they had fabric or leather in places where you never sat or touched and they were heavy and getting them into a studio apartment in midtown, Man Ma midtown Manhattan was almost impossible. So, um, so I started imagining what would the simplest sofa I could, I could do. Um, and so I went through months and months of sketching and, and ended up stumbling on an idea of like, well, I can, I can make a sofa that doesn't have any fasteners or glue to put it together. I can just use sliding dovetail joints, which, um, and so this is a sketchbook of like the first um, iteration of that design, which was very interesting to me because it was a different way of putting something together. So I came back to Maine and prototyped um, first pieces I did. This is a, this is the first piece that went together. It's four components. Um, basically, it has a seat that slides in, and then the back slides in the legs underneath, and then the seat slides back and locks it. So it's a pretty unfortunate looking object. Um, <laughs> and, but I wasn't worried, that worried about um, aesthetics, I guess. Um, but this was the inspiration for what came afterwards, which was, um, which was that there was this generation of machinery in manufacturing that was just taking hold in factories, which was a computer controlled routing woodworking machines. And uh, this is a fairly advanced one. Back then it was, it was a simpler, um, not as complicated as this. This is a five axis CNC joiner or CNC router. Um, but so the machinery is out there in big factories, big manufacturers had the machines, but they were using them to drill holes for screws the same way that um, they had been building stuff before, except just a little faster with these machines. So I saw that as a huge opportunity. Because um, to me, it seemed like it was, it was like driving a Ferrari in first gear with the parking brake on, you know, and not realizing there was a fifth or sixth gear in it. So, um, so the chair design led to a whole series of other designs where I realized I can use 
these interlocking sliding joints um, to make pieces of furniture go together um, without fasteners, without glue, and a massive amount of surface-to-surface -surface joinery. So, and it also, because it was a dry assembly, um, it allowed the wood to move with the seasons without actually pulling on the structure. So it was stronger than traditional furniture. It would never come apart. Um, you could park a truck on a table like this, and it could also ship flat in a box, which has been one of the banes of existence of big manufacturers forever, which is when you make a table like that, it gets that size very quickly in the process. And then it has to go through your shop, and then it has to go through your finishing room, and then it has to go through your packing room or your warehouse. And moving something like that um, without damaging it is very hard. Getting it from your warehouse into a store and from the store into somebody's house or it, you know, to the final destination is very hard. And so this actually promised a way to do direct shipment of a piece of furniture like that um, by FedEx in two or three days. And the assembly is, is so simple. And I have an example of a customer who made, um, who made a little video for us of putting together. <laughs> so he's, this is a, uh, a two drawer file cabinet, a two drawer small file cabinet. And uh, so he's unpacked it from the box. There are graphic instructions. And <laughs> so <laughs> so it's kind of, you know, IKEA furniture, you know, a lot of ready to assemble furniture is it always, it never looks as good as the picture on the box. You know, it's a disappointment. And so this is, a, was a breakthrough in terms of that I could make solid wood, really beautiful furniture um, that had all the efficiencies of ready to assemble furniture. So, and I also, you know, so I, the drawer also would ship flat and go together uh, with sliding parts, eventually. So we really took all the air out of shipping and, and making furniture. That was classic. Uh, thank you. Okay. So my, my, as an industrial designer, the way I make a living is by selling ideas. I sell intellectual property. So I got a really wonderful patent lawyer who lived in Warren, Maine. Uh, who is in his 80s. He was kind of in his, in his semi-retirement, but he came out to help me um, apply for a patent um, so I could go out and try to sell the license to this joiner system because I thought this was a very big idea. And in May of 1993, I introduced it at um, the International Contemporary Furniture Show in New York City. Um, with the idea not of selling furniture, but of selling ideas and getting publicity so I could get entrance. And so that I did, actually. We were very successful um, getting in the press, and op it opened a lot of doors. And I spent the next seven or eight months trying to convince owners of big, manu big, big furniture companies that they needed to rent my design. And they would have this totally new way of reaching their customers. And uh, totally failed. Uh, so. <laughs> I ended up, uh, I, you know, I, I hit a point where I had to make a decision whether I was going to drop it and go back to New York and figure something out or keep going. So I decided, well, I'll just start a little company. It'll be a laboratory. I'll kind of do it in a microcosmic way and, pr you know, continue adding value to the idea. And then I'll sell, I'll sell the idea. So I didn't want to buy a CNC router. Um, because they cost about a quarter million dollars plus, you know, just the, it would, um, I was never interested in growing a big business. I was really kind of focused on licensing. So we had to figure out ways of making the furniture without the technology that it was designed for. So I, I basically came up with an artisan approach to manufacturing, um, which, um, was basically using this, the basic the principles, except we didn't have automated machines. I had people pushing, um, pushing jigs and things through. So, so one of the things that I, one of the breakthroughs is that 
Um, the, to make a, a 20, a 36 inch sliding dovetail, you know, um, usually dovetails are in drawers. And they, there is a French dovetail uh, traditionally, which was a way to attach a tabletop to a base. And they are, cabinet makers hate them because they're very difficult because uh, you have this long friction joint and it's, uh, it's a very difficult thing to get right. And so, um, so I had to figure out a way to take the, um, the tolerances, to make the dovetails fit in a way that was strong enough um, and tight enough that we could do it in a production setting. And uh, so I designed a machine that would cut the male dovetails um, very precisely. And then we took this, this machine, which is called an inverted pin router, and which basically the router is underneath the table. Um, there's a jig. I designed all these jigs for, so every process there was a different jig that was a guide. Um, so there was a pin that dropped down from the top and the jig was attached to the piece that was being cut. And so it sucked down with the vacuum. So um, the guide pin would clamp down, the bit would come up, and then it would push the, um, the part through. And we were able to figure out a way, I'll show you the secret. Uh, we had those little pins that go down that fit in the slot. If you make them smaller in small increments, it makes the slot wider. So we were able to get, and so I had a bunch of these machines that were five one thousandths of an inch in difference. So we were able to open um, up those slots to get the perfect fit. And we use different types of dovetails. We use mated tapered dovetails and it's, you know, it's kind of technical. It was, um, we reached a, an, um, a machining of wood that most woodworkers don't think is possible. You know, they, they kind of, they don't get it. Uh, because they're used to tolerances that are sixteenth of sixteenths of an inch or thirty seconds of an inch, so we're dealing in hundredths of an inch, basically. Um, another cool thing about um, what we were able to do um, in '95, I rented a space down on West Commercial Street in the old Match Company building. You know that old factory building painted different colors. So I've been in there, and it was a total mess when we went in. It was uh, two dollars and forty cents a square foot, right. and so. And so we're, uh, I've been in there ever since and I've done a lot of work on the space. And it's a lot more than 240 cents a foot now. Um, but it enabled us to do a large volume of furniture in a very small amount of space because um, we didn't have workbenches, we had carts. Um, so piles of parts moved around the shop and we did, you know, we did a lot of work on creating the most efficient way of making the furniture this way. And so this is like, this is 10 sofas that are in the spray room. So parts for 10 sofas. And uh, this was a big project out in California. We did, uh, had a lot of customers out in California. So the first years, the furniture was very kind of craftsman looking, a little, I love Japanese design, so there was a little bit of um, that influence. And, and after um, four or five years, it's like I realized I, um, I, I got feedback from our customers that we, um, that my stuff was very masculine and not feminine. And that it was, you know, it was very kind of, you know, heavy and there were no curves in anything that I did. So, um, so I set about to try to figure out a way to introduce curves into the pieces and make them lighter. So, um, so started using curving edges, but also figured out a way to make a, an illusion of the thickness of the piece of the top um, tapering. So it looks very narrow and then widens out, which um, was a nice little discovery um, that happens after spending, you know, a hundred hours figuring out, you know, playing with rounded edges and having no success. Um, so this was a cool piece. Uh, the largest piece we had done up to that point um, which I've assembled that piece on the third floor of an 1800s brownstone in, uh, in Boston because I can take it up the stairs one piece, one component at a time and put it together myself. So there are things that you can do with this kind of furniture that, and the other cool thing is that when the piece is put together, the joinery is invisible. You don't see, it's not like a puzzle kit where you see tabs and slots and things like that. And, uh, so then a third series got even more curvaceous. I started playing more without, you know, um, putting curves into the outlines and um, playing with that. And, um, 
and all the while I was trying to license the patent. Um, and you know, every every couple of years I would make a foray down to High Point in North Carolina and meet with manufacturers, and they were like, um, "That's a whole other discussion about why the industry was not interested in innovation." Um, but leave it to say that most of that industry has moved to China now in terms of manufacturing or died on the, on the, on the vine because they, because um, guys, it's just private equity. It's like, I, I can rant about that for a long time. Um, but they don't, like to buy, they don't like to invest in overhead. And so to pay a 5% royalty to a, for a, a brilliant idea, they won't do it because, you know, Got this, some jerk designer is going to be making a lot of money if they're successful. So um, last, um, I, I started, wanted to move away from the craftsman kind of thing. And so I, I also was looking at, there's a new um, blight coming our way from the Midwest of ash, the emerald ash borer. So um, we're going to, ash trees are going to go the same way as, ch as chestnut trees. Um, went and so there's going to be a lot of ash lying around so I figured I got to try to figure out a way to make ash more acceptable as a fine furniture would so and also I wanted to do a more urban hip you know I wanted to get on the cover of Doyle magazine so um, and I also did this is another short video um, this was the most modular piece I did and this kind of shows the, it's kind of more an illustration of my way of thinking um, so the panels on the back are, can be painted different colors, so you can switch them out. Um, but they're basically ten components that make up this whole system. But you can make you can make a bookcase that went on for forty feet, and uh, they just they're stacking and self-locking. And uh, so I kind of I've been designing puzzles, you know, in a way. Um, so that's a that's a massive piece of furniture that can, um, and the biggest part is like that big, so pretty cool. Um, so the uh, anyway, after 20 years, I kind of burnt out. Um, we sold um, probably about 10,000 pieces of furniture. Um, I think my staff at one point got to I had 18 people working for me. Um, we had a, two retail stores. We had one in Portland and one in Freeport for a while. Um, I did five trade shows around the country every year. And, uh, and we were selling a lot of furniture, but I was still waiting <laughs> for somebody, to, you know, to take the ball and run with it. Because I was, because uh, um, I never really thought that I was going to be doing all these different things other than designing, which is what I really love doing. So, um, so about five years ago, I decided it was time to sh reverse direction. I've kind of ex ac accepted that uh, I, that the idea is still a great idea. I just wasn't lucky. I think my timing was not great um, in terms of uh, the world wasn't ready for it. I still think that this is the way furniture is going to be made. Um, in probably 25 years, somebody's going to, some curator somewhere is going to say, you know, there's a really nutty guy in Maine who was making furniture this way for, for a while. So I'm, uh, so I think there's, um, I've been shrinking my business. It's still going. Green Design Furniture is still online. We don't have a store. I have a showroom um, that's by appointment in a little studio in the back of the Nine Stones building on Union Wharf, which has a really nice view down the water. Uh, we're still in the shop, um, which is now kind of a co-op. I have four different businesses that are renting corners of the space. Um, a former employee of mine is now in charge of um, making my furniture on commission. So, um, so I'm spending more time designing. And the first thing I kind of uh, got hooked on was I've been learning how to carve in a style of Japanese netsuke. Um, have you ever hear the book, The uh, Hair with the Amber Eyes? Do you know? Um, so there's this, I, I, ha I brought a netsuke. It's a Japanese art form that uh, probably started in the 17th century. There's a little knob on the end of a, um, a, a little purse that would go under, on a string, under a sash on a kimono. And, and so the, this little carved piece would keep the, uh, the purse from dropping out. It would hang over the top. But it kind of became the Rolex watch of its time. And uh, so there was this unbelievably wonderful uh, sculptures. And I think 
I saw it in the Boston Museum of Fine Art. The first time I ever saw it, I think I was 21 years old. They, BFA had a case of these, and they were just these magical sculptures that were tiny, um, but probably the most, as beautiful and as expressive um, as any Michelangelo um, sculpture. So um, I, <coughs> take a moment. Um, I never thought of myself as an artist. I, I, and I think, and one of the discussions is about the difference between art and design. Um, but lately, I've been um, I've been sitting in a in a, dis, in a, a salvaged dentist chair, uh, <laughs> teaching myself how to carve very small objects, with the idea that there's actually some crossover in terms of technology. Because I think people that are learning how to make stuff today are going right to 3D printing. They're they're working on computers. And so they will never have the kind of tactile sense of what, it, what a piece of wood feels like or you know, how, to, how to make something. Because the computer is not, it's a fantastic thing, um, but it's, uh, there are limitations, I think. And so I think being able to draw, being able to, uh, to make things and then translate it into computer is very, I think there's an opportunity there, which is pretty much what I did with the furniture. So um, I've done some traveling in Japan, and I visited a bunch of carvers. Um, the, the coolest one was this guy who wasn't doing small carvings. He was doing very, very large carvings. He's like a master temple Buddha carver. And um, so I brought some samples of things. But this is, um, these are some early pieces I made. They're, they're about that big, um, finely carved. I'm using jeweler's tools. Um, a little weird basket. And the kind of thing that with not knowing at all what I'm doing, I'm probably f stumbling onto figuring stuff out that if I had taken a class, I, they, nobody would have ever let me do this. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's this is, I look at this now and I can't believe that this is one of the early pieces I made. I think it's ridiculous. Very complex. Um, OK, so that's how are we doing time-wise? We're great. OK. Yeah. So I can, I can pause there because um, I can, you know, I have other slides um, that are talking about design and getting more into nitty gritty, but I think that would be, this is a good place yeah, to a stop. Place. Okay. Do you want to join me? Yeah. Okay. Fabulous. Um, I did bring a couple of show and tell things. Great. We can get things going both directions if you like. Okay. Yee. I can't, I can't get that now. But. Has anybody else seen that collection of Natsuke in the in that museum? It's extraordinary. I've only visited that museum that museum a couple of so times. And the, so one boom. of the things I'm working on right now is um, in Japan. I, I met a few um, knife makers, like seventh, eighth generation knife makers, who had, whose grand, great great grandparents were making samurai swords. And so it occurred to me that um, there's no carving on American cult cutlery. So I'm thinking, well, oh, maybe there's some kind of crossover there to, to do some decorative stuff. So I've been, I got, I got um, some pieces, some parts from a uh, Japanese manufacturer and I've been playing around with um, different ways that I could do, uh, kind of do some carvings that would then work with, um, with, with manufacturing small things. It's like, and I think there's, I think there's something that's caught me. Um, that's that little carving. Um, what type of wood is this? That's basswood. And, and this is an early sketchbook. Um, so just looking at this, it's kind of interesting because it gives you an idea of what the thought process is around making stuff. Yeah. Steve? Yeah. OK. Great. Well, thanks, Doug. OK. Yeah, and I've been trying to think. Like, hearing you speak, I feel like a few things we keep circling back through. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like. If I've been hearing you right, I hear there's obviously people, there's you or a craftsman, there's some person involved, and there are ideas involved, and then there's machinery at some point. Mm -hmm. And it seems like in your experience, the, that cycle has gone various ways. So hearing you talk about um, carving Natsuke here at the end, mm -hmm. you're really interested in that the person interacting directly with the item, and then maybe machinery will come in later, who knows? Whereas yeah. your, your path to furniture seems like it was the other way. No. There was this great opportunity offered or suggested by 
computer-aided routers mm -hmm. that allowed you to think, oh, wow, using this tool, we could do this great thing, have this great idea. But then you brought that back down to people mm -hmm. and put people in the middle of, of making something that computers had suggested to you. Yep. So I just think that's really interesting. I feel like it's interesting. This is part of our moment is mm -hmm. how do we interact with machinery? Where's, mm -hmm. the, where's the fruitful moment where, where ideas are coming to life rather than us missing out on a tactile experience mm -hmm. that would enrich our abilities? Yep. So I'd love to hear, I'm curious to hear you say, say more about your thinking about that, about people and machines yeah. in our current moment. Well, my, originally I kind of, uh, I had a reaction to seeing things, people who are making things and rejecting technology and saying, I'm, you know, machines are bad, machines make things worse. Um, and uh, so I'm just going to keep using my hand chisels to knock out hand dovetails. Um, and that's, it's very nostalgic and it's great if your wife has a trust fund. Um, <laughs> but it's very hard to get paid um, for your time when you're doing something that's a total feel good luxury thing for you to do. But it's to the customer, it's not, you're not really giving them greater value by doing a hand dovetail drawer, um, I think. Um, and so, or you know, some people, some people might dig that, but it's not, <laughs> to me, that is um, an indulgence when there's technology available where you can make a beautiful dovetail drawer um, with a router. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm playing with the mic. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so, um, so I, you know, and there's this whole world of furniture making that is called studio furniture, where people go to programs at RISD or you know Rochester and learn how to make incredibly beautiful, well-crafted pieces of art. Their sculpture, you know, so a dining table that cost twenty-five thousand dollars that took some guy, you know, six months to make out of it, some exotic wood, um, and but um, and so the amount of time he spent crafting it was probably much much longer than the time he spent thinking about what it was going to look like or how he was going to make it because he only had to make it once. Um, if he had to, um, and so. Anyway, it just, it just when there's machinery out there that can do a better job than the human hand, I don't see why, um, why you shouldn't avail yourself of that, of technology. But that's, and that's a different thing, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if I'm hearing you right, that's a different thing than, than this Netsuke moment. Right. Well, I'm, you know, I'm, you know, the same way that I was a craftsman making furniture that led me to this new technology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I have to, um, until I really learn how to make things at this tiny scale yeah. um, and to do patterns or whatever. Um, so I'm, I'm in the fulminating mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. part right now where I'm just learning. And so mm -hmm. I can, and at some point it's going to get into my sensibility that, um, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, it's kind of like, it's something is pulling me to do this. Mm -hmm. And I think it may lead me to what the next thing is, the next realization. But um, the only way that happens is if you're sitting in the chair for, for a thousand hours. <laughs> and uh, you, know, you have to be available because uh, those things, um, I'm not a genius. I'm, I'm really not, it's like you know, people who kind of, um, who go right to a solution um, are, um, are amazing and I'm, I'm just not one of those. I, I spent a long time trying to figure stuff out. And it's a, it's a long process. You can look in that book and it's like, you can see I'm, I'm chewing over an idea for pages and pages and drawing it. And then I'll let it go and I'll come back to it again. And, um, and so it's a, so I'm, I'm basically have learned to trust that I'm, I'm got to swim through these un uncharted water. And, uh, Which is another leitmotif I feel like in your, in your trajectory is this alternation between efficiency and comfort with uncertainty mm -hmm. or stumbling along. I feel like you use phrases like that about mm -hmm. certain moments or this, like take, taking the X thousand hours mm -hmm. to scritch away, figure it out, draw it over and over again. Mm -hmm. And then there's this moment where something is wicked efficient. Yeah. Um, and so that I think those two things are often viewed as 
opposite. Like we need to somehow erase the uncertainty so we can have only efficiency. Yeah. But it seems like we need both. Yeah. You need a moment to be uncertain, inefficient, if you will. But inefficiency is the most efficient way <laughs> to learn something, right? Yeah. Well, I wouldn't call if see. It's it's interesting that you look at the design process mm -hmm. as being inefficient, and because in a in a corporate setting, um, there's always a constant tension between the design people who are doing design and the corporate people and the marketing people who like, why can't you do this on a schedule? Why can't you invent the next big thing? Um, it's because uh, they, they don't really understand that, that it's, a, it's kind of a, a um, it's, I don't know, magical is not the word <laughs> because, <laughs> because it's a grinding, hard um, mm -hmm. commitment uh, to being able to live with a question. Yeah. And actually, the first part is trying to figure out what the problem is. Right. You know? What's the question? Yeah, what's the question? Yeah. And then once you figure that out, then you can start working on a solution. Mm -hmm. um, but usually, um, most of your first attempts are realizing that you're asking the wrong question mm -hmm. or that you, you don't know what the problem is. Mm -hmm. And so um, I love design. And I, um, I don't think it's like if you ask a group of people, like, do you know the names of any industrial designers? Um, it's like Johnny Ivey. At Johnny Ivey, who's running the design at Apple right now, is an industrial designer. Um, Steve Jobs was not an industrial in I'm sorry, go ahead. No, um, uh, you must have inspired uh, people who work for you. Have any of them gone on to become furniture designers? Oh, yeah. I've, um, yeah. Evan Blaney, who I, I, I was hoping he'd be here, but. Uh, um, John, um, I'd say, I'd say, yeah, it was like one of the things that was frustrating was that I attracted, I mean, one of the reasons why I started this business in Maine instead of New York City was one, because I could afford to do it here, I couldn't do it in New York. The other was that there was this incredible um, kind of um, spirit of, of, of young people that wanted to come learn how to, how to do really cool stuff and make stuff. And so, um, so I was constantly hiring really great, talented people who had very little experience, spending two years training them, and then they would leave <laughs> and go start their own business. Um, or, you know, do, do something else. But that was kind of, uh, um, which was very frustrating because the, when you're training them, they're not really being productive. And then just at the point where they're, they're going to start being able to make stuff efficiently is when they tell you they're going to leave, and it's kind of heartbreaking. Are there any women? Yes. Two. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. Women a bunch of women. Woodwork. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, the, a lot, it's interesting because um, a lot of the the women that went to work, that came to work for me, ended up in other fields, um, but doing really interesting things as well. I don't, I'm not sure if any stayed with craft. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is anybody using your idea that you patented in a limited shop somewhere with the dovetails and things like that? You know, the, know it took me like three years to figure out the engineering to do this. Um, and so um, it would, the patent is expired at the end of this year. <gasps> So Not it's, a, it's 20 feet, no, it's a, it's, a util, it's a process patent. And so if it is, I kind of feel like it's time for me to let go. It's, <laughs> and that's it's like, you know, and if it gets, you know, yeah. I'm, there's, there's some opportunities for me to teach people how to do this, mm -hmm. um, you know, now that it's public domain. Um, I still, people are going to pull out their hair trying to figure it out, and I've been doing it pretty successfully for a long time. So I know a lot of, a lot of secrets to make this work. It's, it's, to make something, it's one of the things I loved about this idea is it's very simple. It's actually when you see the pieces going together, you're going, well, yeah, what's, what's the big deal? To make something that simple is really hard. Mm -hmm. It's really hard um, to get it, um, you know, to make furniture that has no hardware. Um, to make it fit so it just, you know, so it's just right every time. Um, it's the Chinese uh, manufacturers not to make it whatever? Nope, no, nope. we might, you know, it's interesting because I've had a couple of manufacturers overseas that, that literally copied and pasted my catalog 
and we're selling pieces. I got a call one day from a customer of mine said, I just saw one of your pieces at Pier 1, you know. And I went down and there was this piece made out of some jungle wood, uh, very poorly. They didn't use the joinery, they, they took the look of the piece. And so we were able to stop that, actually. We had, when somebody, when a customer calls and confuses your pe somebody else's piece for yours, it's called trade dress, when they've appropriated, misappropriated your look. Um, that's something you can defend in court. And so most of the knockoffs of my stuff were, were not the joinery system, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And they were the look of the pieces. And so, which is kind of funny because I never really saw myself as a stylist. You know, most of my designs were, um, you know, I didn't, in, a, in furniture, American furniture companies, they come out with a new line of furniture every six months. They do, they do a show in High Point, North Carolina and they've got to come out with, the next thing is French Provincial or Eskimo or, you know, whatever the next thing is. And it's ridiculous because it took me, there were, you know, I broke, I broke my career into three phases. Um, and that was 20 years worth of work and probably, there are, you know, 200 designs maybe I came up with. And I was, um, but it wasn't like every six months. We did, I did a catalog every four years. And I brought, actually there are some catalogs on the table there which is the last catalog I will ever print. Um, there's still, I still have thousands of copies left. So, <laughs> so take several. Don't, yeah, don't, don't feel bashful. Um, okay. Great. Are there other questions from you guys? Questions that you're curious about? Is, is there not any way that you can convince the people at IKEA to make a better quality product? I tried. They were, <laughs> My I try, you know, and I thought, stuff and it's crap. yeah, oh, it's terrible. And uh, you know, and the, my pitch to, to IKEA was, um, you're making stuff that is landfill. It's just that it spends four or five years as furniture, you know, as <laughs> as a prop, um, before you see it on the sidewalk because people, because all those fasteners, you can't get them apart, yeah. and so you see them broken down on the sidewalk. And I said, if you made it without any fasteners, um, it could all go into the same you know, container, or you can make it so you're not designing it for disassembly. You're not, it's actually, it's got a much longer life in landfill than it does as a functional object. So they should be designing it for that. And so I tried. Um, I tried with L.L. Bean, you know, and uh, I kept running into the same problem where they, um, companies like Pottery Barn, L.L. Bean, love, love the idea, but they didn't want to manufacture it. They're not manufacturers, they buy from vendors. And I didn't want to be a vendor to Pottery Barn because I knew that, you know, if I built my company up to make massive amounts of furniture, then in 10 years they would be saying, well, there's a company in China that can do it for $50 less and, you know, and uh, what are you going to do about it? And they would drop you like a hot rock, which happened to a bunch of friends of mine. And so um, I didn't want to be, I wanted to get the royalty. I wanted to get that, that little percentage of everything that got sold. And so um, I had a lot of fun. <laughs> and, you know, I think running a business was, that's a whole other art form uh, about how do you manage a business, how do you manage people. And so it was challenging for a lot of the time because it was basically design is solving problems. Mm -hmm. And so is business. It's constant, you know, ha marketing is like, this is, how do you market high-end furniture that um, does the same thing that IKEA does. Because it's basically, I created something that's totally divergent, two divergent ideas. Um, well, there's a word for that. A paradox. No, well, paradoxical or... Um, and it, well, it comes out in the phrase that you, that you use on your website, because it's manufactured, but it's artisan. Mm -hmm. um, and so putting those two things together is pretty mind-bending. It's yeah. neat. Well, that was kind of... Because I, I, I never wanted to own the, you know, the quarter million dollar machines. Because mm -hmm. once you own those machines, they have to be running tw at least 12 or 13 hours a day. Yeah. And then it's like, then, uh -huh. I mean, I was, I was not getting much sleep having a retail store. And yeah. uh, so, anyway, it's, uh, uh -huh. that, that would have been, that would have changed the whole, you know, and it could have been one of those stupid mistakes that I made along the way. <laughs> that <laughs> if I had done it early on, I might be in a completely different place right now. You seem pretty content, though. Maybe it's okay to be where you are. I, yeah. I yeah. mean, it was, you know, there's, there's a, letting go is really hard. I didn't, you know, there's this, uh, I have 
this image of Wiley Coyote, um, you know, where he's gone off over the edge of the cliff, and, but he doesn't realize it. So I think that was like the last, the last four or five years of my, you know, of running, having all these people in the stores and all this stuff. I was running around, and and I had gone way past my time, but I didn't know how to stop. You know, I just had to carry it forward. So that was painful. Gosh. Yes. Wow. I think your furniture is so recognizable that I always know when it's you, when I see it. And it really stands out from so many other things. And really great job. You can find a, a bunch of it's in the Arabica coffee shop on Commercial Street now. Because when I closed my showroom, um, they were just opening their new store. So I said, hey, you want, you want to borrow some furniture? <laughs> so, yeah, thank you. It's very sweet. And uh, any so other? I have yeah. a question about the early time when you were starting up in yeah. Portland, came to Portland to start up. Um, what things helped you along your way and what things got in your way starting up a business like yours here? Um, Great employees helped me, and also um, employees became the hardest part of running the business, you know, managing people. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, there were people that made huge contributions and helped me. Um, you know, there was a point where the company was like five or six years old, um, where I had completely had to change the manufacturing model. We, I, I had based this model on, I was looking at one thing, which is how, um, how many hours does it take to make this dining table. And so we were, we were making this dining table um, and it took like 12 hours to make it from start to finishing, uh, ready, ready to ship. And so, so for five years we tried to figure out, well, how do we get the time down? So we ended up figuring out we could do, make 12 tables at a time, even though we'd only sold two or three. Um, we could box, you know, take the seven that we hadn't made, put it in a shelf, and, and when somebody ordered it, we could sell it as fast as we could. And um, so we got the time down to like six hours per table, and it looked great. Except that after a couple of years, I had a quarter million dollars in inventory sitting on shelves, and, and I was losing money because we were spending time making furniture that we hadn't sold. Mm -hmm. And so we had to learn a method of moving individual pieces very quickly through the shop. Um, which scared the hell out of all the craftsmen in the shop. Oh, gosh. And because uh, they thought, you know, for them it was like, you know, it was a whole different type of orga organizational way to make the furniture. And so that took really great people mm -hmm. um, to help me fight the people that were resisting change, <laughs> you know, in my own organization. Yeah. And yeah, tra well, we we did advertise. Yeah, we did advertising nationally in the New York Times, Sunday New York Times Magazine, and New Yorker Magazine, and and we were always experimenting with Architectural Digest and different types of home furnishing magazines. But um, really, we built the database by um, by people responding to our ads, and then when we did trade shows in different parts of the country, we would call them and say, "Look, we're going to be here. What do you want us to bring?" And so um, so it. I think over half, historically, over half of our furniture went to the West Coast, um, or west of the Mason-Dixon line, and uh, um, and then and probably, you know, two thirds of that went to Northern California and the Pacific Northwest. Um, which was very popular in that part of the world, and not not a big market in Maine, but so now we're basically I am the guy answering the phone. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, and and I do all the customer contact. It's a much smaller group. I've stopped advertising. I basically am making myself more difficult to get to. Um, and once in a while, I will send out an email or I'll post something on the company Facebook page. But I'm in a way I'm I'm kind of I don't I'm not um, I've got myself accustomed to the idea that there's going to be another chapter after this, which means that I'm ready to let go. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not sure how, how long I'm going to keep doing this. I'm, I'm actually working on, a, um, I think I've, I may have found a, somebody um, who can make my furniture, another former employee who's in a much better, um, who's in a, whose business is growing really nicely. And so that might be a better relationship for me than, than the one I have now. And, or, you know, it's like, and, but I'm trying to think, it's like, do I want to get 
pulled back in um, or should I just let it go? And, uh, you know, it's very self-indulgent. I'm, I'm kind of um, spoiled because I like, I'm, I'm much happier, I'm much more creative when I'm happy, you know. <laughs> Note you to know, self, yes. And, yeah, and, and <laughs> I found that all the stress, um, and, and, you know, it was like with the economy and, and all the money migrating to the one percenters, you know, it was like mm -hmm. our business, we used to have school teachers who bought the furniture, you know, and they'd have to save for it. But, man, it's like after 2000, um, after 2001, actually, and it was before September 11th, mm -hmm. um, something was up, and it was like, you know, so we had fewer people buying buying bigger orders of furniture. You know, so we were selling for the same amount of furniture, but it was like you had to work much harder because those people were harder to find and and not as um, I don't know. It was just a different mindset. Wow. And so um, yeah, so and we were. This is the thing about I the furniture that was designed to be sold in Pottery Barn was actually a way to mass produce high quality furniture because there's so much goddamn ugly furniture made being man mass produced now. And so this would be a way to get reasonably priced furniture mm -hmm. into, um, into people's hands that, that would be durable, would be heirloom quality that you could pass down for generations, um, easily repairable. I mean, it was like, it was, it was not the furniture that I'm selling now. I'm, I'm selling $5,000 dining tables. Um, and I think it's awful, but when you're making things one at a time in an artisan shop, mm -hmm. it's very expensive. Mm -hmm. And so if I had, the same table could be made by, for Pottery Barn to sell for $1,800. Thank you so much. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you.